that's the thing that, and if you go down to Huntsville and look at an F1 engine, because they've got them, they've got one sitting down there, look up at the top of it, okay? The F1 engine, when we tested it, and here's a whole F1 engine here. So here you can see the bottom skirt, okay? This was just to, to sort of shape the flame coming out. The whole, actually this is the engine here. And like I say, there were five of them in the bottom of the, of the Saturn V rocket. They had a million and a half pounds of thrust. So if you had a million and a half pound object sitting on top of this thing, it would, it would just, it would take, it would weigh nothing if you put it on the scale with the other one of these engines going off, okay? It would push a million and a half pounds up. That's how much thrust it had. We had five of those. So the Saturn V rocket had seven and a half million pounds of thrust on the first stage, okay? So the, uh, the statistics about this are amazing, about the Saturn V. Okay, so here is the, here's the, the top end of it, the business end of the rocket, if you will, of the F1 engine. And the engines themselves, it's hard to describe how violent that, that in, the, the thing was when it went off, okay? The first stage of the Saturn V had about a half a million gallons of fuel, had 300,000 gallons of kerosene, which they called RP1, I think. And it had a little over 200,000 gallons of uh, liquid oxygen. And so when that thing went off, these engines, when the, when the first stage lighted, okay, they would hold the rocket down until they got full thrust. It took just a second. If it took more than a second or two, they'd shut the whole thing down. And then the rocket went off. And the first stage used that half million gallons of gas in about two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes. And so these engines, when the thing was going off, would use up 2,000 gallons of fuel per second. Okay. So it was just, it was an explosion, but it was just like slow motion explosion, I guess you could say, because the, the, the amount of horsepower that, that the first stage of the Saturn V produced was 180 million horsepower with all five engines going. Von Braun estimated that 1% of that was turned, was turned into acoustic energy. That's still almost 2 million horsepower of noise, okay? So they would test the thing here. They had a static display, a static test stand down in here, okay? And so they would take the first stage, they would assemble the first stage with all five engines on it, and they would strap it to this big concrete building. And then they would gas the thing up and light it off. And the whole idea was to get that thing to run out of gas, okay? Because the, the engine would boost the first, the whole rocket, the first stage would get it up 38 miles, about, it went up about 38 miles in two and a half minutes, so it's about from here to Festus. And it would be going about 6,000 miles an hour, and then the first stage was out of gas, and it would drop off in the Atlantic Ocean. And nobody went out to pick them up. So the Atlantic Ocean's got, I don't know, 10 or 12 S1Cs, that's what this thing was called. It's laying out there at the bottom, and uh, and that was it. It was it was expendable. It was like a razor blade. Okay, and so when they would strap that thing onto the test stand and light the thing off, what they were trying to do here's what it would look like. Okay, we would see the missile go past the window of where I was working on the on the trucks, and we knew they were going to do a, a test. So we'd find out. You know, everybody would wait around, and they would strap that thing on, and they would there'd be sirens blowing and then they would fire this thing up and it was pointed slightly away from everything, kind of down the river. And they wouldn't test it if there was a cloud layer. They wouldn't test it if the, if the wind was blowing the wrong direction because they would be directing that two million horsepower of noise towards somebody's house. And it would break all the windows and the, you know, all the plaster would come off the walls. And so they would only test it when conditions were right. But we were standing, we would be standing out watching the rocket and the, the, it would shake your clothing. If you had anything in your pocket, it would slap it around. I mean, it, would, it would pound on your chest. You would feel it was like somebody beating on you. Just the, the sound of the, of the Saturn V rocket, the first stage of that thing going off. And so our job, it, so you can imagine the amount of vibration and shaking that this thing was going to be doing. And so our job was to figure out how to get the engines to run for two and a half minutes until it was out of gas. We didn't need them to run for three minutes, just two and a half. And so if you look here, this is one that's been tested. And what I want to show you is, see this right here? 
that's a braided line. It looks like a, a stainless steel brake line that's got stainless steel braid around it. And there's one here, there's one here, there's one right through here. Uh, there is one. They're just all over the place. If you go to Huntsville, look up at the top of that rocket. Everywhere that there's a piece of braided line is a place where we fired up the, the engine and it started shaking so much, these solid stainless steel tubes would shake so much they break. And then stuff would start squirting everywhere. They shut it down, shut it down. So we'd go in there and we'd replace it with a piece of flex line. And we'd fire it up again. And it'd go a few more seconds longer. And then it would shut down again. And so we did that until finally we got two and a half minutes out of it and everybody said, hey, great. It's going to run out of gas. And so that's how, that's how the Saturn fight. Of course, there was a lot more engineering than that that went into it, but everybody knew what the fix was. Everywhere those lines would break, we'd stick in a piece of flex line. Okay. So that's kind of a story. When you go down to Huntsville, just look at the top of those flex lines, and you'll see where we couldn't get that thing to go for two and a half minutes without replacing that line. So here's a picture of the Saturn V itself. This is on this, they're taking the thing to launch. This is down at, at uh, Cape Canaveral. They had this big truck assembly that they were they would creep along to get it to the to the launch pad. The rocket stands about 360 feet tall, so it's longer than a football field if you could lay it down. Okay. This is the top of the first stage here. So this has got a half million gallons of gas in it. Those five F1 engines are down at the bottom. And there was a second stage, and there was a third stage, and then up here was the payload. Right at the very top is the Apollo capsule. Up here is a, a, a little, uh, almost like a, a mask kind of a thing, but it actually had little rockets on top of it. If anything went wrong on the launch pad and they thought the rocket was about to blow up, they could release the Apollo capsule here from the control room. These rockets would light off and it would drag the thing off. This was their escape to get off of that rocket while it was still on the pad. It was like an ejection seat, except they were going to take the whole capsule. So they had. They had a lot of systems built into this thing to try to save the lives of the astronauts, but everybody knew it was a really dangerous deal. And when the Saturn V uh, program was put together, they did not test it when they did the first stage, when they launched it. Uh, you know, the Germans wanted to, uh, to do it so we would get a working first stage and then we'd add a working second stage. And uh, but the military said, no, don't do that. We're going to, because they had uh, generals that were helping them coordinate this whole thing. They said, no, we're going to test the whole thing at once to speed it up, and it worked. We were able to get the Saturn V launched faster than what the Germans wanted to do. Of course, the Germans had seen a great many uh, V-2 rockets explode on the path down in Germany, and they had no illusions how dangerous this whole business was. And so, well, anyway, so that's kind of some stories about the Saturn V. When I went to work the first day on June the 6th of, of uh, 1966, I got up to the Propulsion Vehicle Engineering Lab, and the place I was working was on the third floor. I just had to tell you about what that was like. I went down there, and of course I was 21 years old, and we were going to beat those Ruskies. And I got down there, and it was a big government project. <laughs> Everybody, you know, I got into a room that was about the size of this right here. And it was just totally plain, and there was a row of windows across the back row that looked out toward the, toward the test pad. And everybody had these metal arc desks, just like in the edge of space movies, you know, they had the bright metal trim around the edge of the top, and it was painted gray. And they were all pushed up against the walls on either side. And there was a card table set up in the middle, and a bunch of the engineers were playing bridge at that time. <laughs> this was like 8.30 in the morning or something. And, uh, you know, somebody came over and welcomed me, which was nice, I guess they were expecting me. And the boss was in the corner in the back, John, he was a little older, and all the guys in there were like in their 30s and 40s. So the guys that were a little older, 1966 was only 21 years after the end, after the end of World War II. So all the older guys had been in, you know, aerospace, you know, aerospace engineers during World War II. They divided, they helped design all the airplanes and things that we used in the war. Now they were working in the space business, and they they'd seen a lot and. Uh, and so they handed me, the thing I remember the most was, I just come from the physics department at WashU. You know, our job back then was solving these word problems, essentially, that's what a lot of it is, you know, when they, they give you an assignment. And they handed me a sheet of paper, it was one of those mimeograph sheets that smells like alcohol, you know, with the purple on it. 
Okay? It says, here's the equations. <laughs> I'm just a dumbstruck. I go, what? They're giving me the equations? You know, because of course this was engineering. They already knew exactly how they wanted to solve these problems. You know, and our job was to calculate the frequency, the sympathetic frequency of different things that were failing on the rocket. So if you took a piece of metal and you held it up by a thin wire and you hit it with a hammer, it would make it would ring like a tuning fork. And our job was to calculate what frequency that was. Because what we were trying to do was to tune the rocket so the individual parts of it would not be sympathetic. They wouldn't be a harmonic or a multiple of the basic vibration that the rocket was going to put out by itself. And so they gave me all the formulas to do that. And I just thought, wow, this is pretty neat. And the formulas weren't even very complicated. And so the way that you engineered that was, you could take a structure that would look like some strange claw or something, a nanoformula, for instance, for the frequency of a little rectangle, a little metal rectangle, and one for a little cylinder and little triangles and so forth. And so you just break the thing up into all these different pieces and say, okay, the frequency of this little rectangle here off of this piece is this. You can run through the formula. And here's a hole. Well, it's shaped like a cylinder, so I calculate the frequency of the cylinder, I would subtract it. And what you did was you took all the different pieces and then you added them all up. Where there were holes, you subtracted off things. And when you got to the end, that was the frequency. Okay, that's how, that's how it was done. And so everybody was working with slide rules. There was no computer in that office at all. There wasn't even a hand calculator. Everybody was working with slide. Everybody you saw walking around Marshall Space Flight Center in those days had a slide rule hanging on their hip. For those of you that never have seen it, you know, they used to come with all kinds of cases and all different sizes. And there were circular slide rules. Everybody had their own personal favorite. And, but the, a lot of the rocket was designed with uh, slide rule <coughs> technology. But they came up with the right answers. Okay, so that's enough of, of Marshall Space Flight Center. Let's talk about the eclipse a little bit, unless you all have questions. Anybody have any questions about that? Okay. All right, on to the solar eclipse. So the solar eclipse is going to happen on August the 21st, and around here it'll happen about 20 minutes after 1. And so, let's start with this. You cannot look at the sun. Just go out like today. You wouldn't look at the sun today, would you, with your unaided eye? Well, it's the same thing with the eclipse. Until the totality, and during the totality, it's going to look like nighttime. Until you get to totality, you can't look at the sun. You need solar eclipse glasses or some other mechanism. You can use a pinhole camera. You can project things from a telescope and so forth, but you don't want to look directly at the sun. You'll injure your eyes. Okay? But once the eclipse totality happens, once the, the surface of the sun is covered by the moon and it gets dark, take the glasses off and look at it with the naked eye. There are people who have missed solar eclipses just kept the glasses on the whole time. Thought I gotta keep my eclipse glasses on, they can't see anything. The sun is about a million times brighter than the full moon. Okay, during totality, what you're going to see is the solar corona, and it's about as bright as the full moon. So if this filters out a, you know, all but a millionth of the light so that you can look directly, it's like you're not going to see anything if you don't take these glasses off. So when it gets dark, you want to take the glasses off. All right, so what happens with an eclipse, and I'm sorry, believe it or not, searching the internet, I could not find any better looking graphics than this. But basically, the moon is going to get between the Earth and the sun and cast a shadow back on the Earth. Okay? And the shadow of the moon is going to pass over our area. And that's what's going to happen. And this doesn't happen very often because the moon is not lined up in the very same plane as the, as the orbit of the Earth. If it was, we'd have eclipses every month down around Ecuador or someplace. They have a big eclipse industry down there. But they don't. And the reason is the moon's orbit is tilted five degrees or so to the, to the plane of the Earth. Okay. And so a lot of times when the moon comes back around, it's on top of the sun or it's below the sun when it passes by the sun. And so you don't see the, the moon's shadow is above or below the Earth, and so you don't see it. The other thing that makes it rare is most of the Earth's surface is water. And so a lot of eclipse um, a lot of solar eclipses, they happen mostly out over the oceans. That's where the surface, you know, what most of the surface of the Earth is. And so they're remote. They're hard to get to. Okay? And so it's, it's rare that we get them here 
right across, diagonally across the United States, from Oregon on down to I think it's South Carolina. Okay, we are at pretty much the center of the eclipse path, which is a good thing. What you want with a solar eclipse is you want to spend as much time as possible in the shadow of the moon. So if you're near the edge of the shadow, that shadow is going to kind of you're just going to see a little piece of it, and then it's going to be gone. So if you get out to the edge of the shadow of the moon, you won't see much of the, of the solar eclipse at all because it will be, it'll pass by you very quickly. And so what, what's happened is, if you look at these maps over here, there's a line drawn where the center of that shadow is going to be. And that's where people are going to want to go. Okay, So that line goes just north of DeSoto. I heard a rumor the other day they're expecting a million people <coughs> in DeSoto. I don't know how they're going to get a million people. So <laughs> that's the rumor. There'll be a million people. Yeah. You want to be on that or close to the center line of the moon's shadow so that you'll get the longest time to look at the sun because it's only going to last. The moon's shadow moves very rapidly. It's going to, it's going to swish over us in a little over two minutes, two minutes and 40 seconds if you get in just the right spot, thereabouts. So it's not even going to last three minutes long. Okay. And it's something that you will, I mean, there are, there are things leading up to it, which we're going to go through in a second. But when you get into a total solar eclipse and you see the solar corona, it's, some, it's a sight that you will never forget. Okay? So let's talk about what happens. Um, uh, first of all, not all eclipses are total. Okay, the moon's orbit is elliptical and shaped like an egg. And so the moon, if it's out in the far end of the of its orbit when it passes the sun, it, it won't be large enough from our point of view to cover the sun's disk. And so you get what the, this, is, this is called an annular eclipse. Okay? So you, you're not, you're not going to see the solar, solar corona. You're just going to see the sun looking like a ring. Not so good. But what you're going to see starting about an hour and a half before the totality happens, which is the main event, you'll see a little nick side of the sun's image through your eclipse glasses. And you'll know that the eclipse has started. And that will just grow larger and larger as the moon moves across the surface of the sun. Okay? And I say the surface of the sun like you could get out and walk on it if you had ceramic boots or something, but you can't. The sun is a ball of gas. And what you see here is just the, the point that the sun's, that this ball of gas, below this level, it's opaque. Above it, it's transparent. Okay? That's what the surface of the sun actually is. And so as the moon moves across here, the sun will become more and more of a crescent, a thin little crescent. And you'll see things like this on the ground. See, look at this. This is just sunlight coming through a tree with you know leaves in it. And what's happening is that the, the little space between the leaves that moves back and forth, each one of those little spaces is like a pinhole. And it's actually creating a little image of the crescent on the ground. Next time you look at, at the same thing happens without an eclipse. If you ever notice the spots under a tree, they're all circular. They're little images of the sun. And of course, it's a circle. And so this dappled looking uh, shadow that you see are just actually little thin old images of the sun you see every day. Well, when the, when the sun is being covered, it turns into crescents. And so you'll see that. Okay, so when we get close to the eclipse, right here, and this is a bad representation of it, but I couldn't find one that was any better, you'll get a thing called Bailey's Beads. Okay, and what that is, is the, the moon has almost covered the sun's surface, but there's still, but the, but the edge of the moon, it's, it's got mountains on it and valleys and so forth, and it's the sunlight flowing through the valleys <coughs> at the edge of the moon. Okay, and so the, it'll look like a little spang of a bright, star-like jewels, okay? And it'll still look like daytime. As long as there's the tiniest little bit of the sun's surface that shows around the edge of the moon, you'll think it's daytime, okay? And so you'll see Bailey's Beats. When you see Bailey's Beats happen, it's close, okay? And then finally you get down to one last valley, and that's called the diamond ring effect. And so this be this bright spangle at the edge of the, of the shadow of the moon. That's it, you're going into totality as soon as you see that. And then finally, you'll get to the point where the moon has covered the sun. Okay? And what you'll see is the solar corona, the outer atmosphere, the
transparent <coughs> atmosphere of the sun itself. And you can't see this from Earth except in a solar eclipse. And the reason is the sun is so bright that the scattering through the atmosphere just obscures this. Remember, this thing actually, it, it looks like it's pretty bright. It's actually only as bright as the full moon, give or take. And you'll see this around here, and pictures don't do it justice. Okay? When you see a picture, it just looks like a glow around a black hole, and you say, well, what's the big whoop about that? But when you actually see one, you know, the colors in nature are always so much better than the pictures. Nobody, do you ever notice that when you try to take a picture of a sunset, it just doesn't really capture that sunset? And it's the same with this. This is a natural phenomenon. And what you're looking at is not just glowing gas, this is, this is actually plasma, okay? There's not actually molecules up there. What this is is a jumble of atomic particles because it's so hot. The solar corona is about 10 million degrees Fahrenheit, okay? It's this glowing gas of plasma, and it has a mother of pearl sort of a quality to it that you just can't describe and you can't take a picture of. It. It's like when you pull up a live fish out of the water sometimes, they just have an iridescent quality to them. And when they die, they just kind of turn dark. It's the same kind of difference. When you see it in nature with your own two eyes, that's what makes it so unforgettable. It's the color of it. Is. Okay, this is maybe a better picture of it. But you'll notice, look at the corona looks different than the first picture I showed you. This is a typical, this is the way the sun's atmosphere looks when the sun is active, and there's a lot of sunspots. Okay? Right now, no sunspots. So what our solar corona is probably going to look like when we see this eclipse is more like this. Just not so much structure to it. Okay. It's probably going to look something like this rather than like this. Okay. Here's another. This is a pretty good representation of how the corona can look. You'll see the details in it. Okay. And then around the edge, if you look carefully, you might see little orange kind of loops around the, the, the edge of the moon. And what those are solar prominences. Those are storms on the surface of the sun. And they loop up, and so you can see them around the edge of the moon. And you see these little orange things around the edge. And here again, the color, they're like neon or something. It's hard to describe what this is going to look like until you see it. The other thing is, it'll get nighttime. What I would recommend is, if you can get to a place to look at the eclipse where you're on the top of, uh, of a rise, and you can see the whole horizon around you. For two reasons. One, once you get to totality, if you look around the horizon, it's going to look like sunset. It's going to be a red tinge all the way around the horizon because you're looking out to the edge of the moon's shadow. So from our point of view, that's going to be about 25 or 30 miles away from where you are. If you're at the center of the shadow, you're going to look out towards the edge of that. It'll look like sunset. Okay? Second reason is you can see the shadow of the moon coming toward you if you get up where you can see the horizon. So as you're watching the, the sun become more and more of a crescent, you can see this dark thing coming from the northwest. Okay. Once totality hits, you'll see, here's the sun here, and so you'll see the corona around it. You can see stars behind it. Okay? And here's the way the stars are going to look. For those of you that are familiar with the constellations, this is Regulus. <coughs> That's the brightest star in Leo. So astrology fans, what's the sign? Leo, the lion, right? The sun is in Leo, literally. <laughs> okay. And so here's Regulus. Here's the loop. Here's the tail here of the lion. You see Jupiter down here. Of course, Jupiter, you can see, you know, just wait until sunset. But you'll, you'll see four planets because there's Jupiter, Venus, Mars. You won't be able to see. It's too close to the sun. Actually, we're looking across the solar system, beyond the sun. And there's Mars over in its orbit, kind of on the other side of the sun. You'll be able to see it. And then Mercury. Mercury is always hard to see. There have been astronomers back in the 1800s that would study Mercury, and the whole time they would get to see it, they added it all together, it was only a few hours, because it's never very far from the sun. They just have to look right after sunset, hope there's no clouds there and it's transparent enough. But you'll be able to see Mercury there. Okay. And so this is the field of the, it, it'll, it'll look like a moonlit night, but you'll still be able to see the brighter stars and objects. And what will happen is, of course, the animals will get confused. Nocturnal animals will be stirring around to what? And they'll want to come out. And the daytime animals will want to head to their nest. And then two, two minutes and 40 seconds later, the whole thing gets reversed because the sun comes back from the 
you know, the, from behind the moon, and suddenly, just with the tiniest little bit of the sun showing around the edge of the moon, just like that, it'll be daytime. So, when you come to the eclipse, you'll see that diamond, the Bailey's beads and the diamond ring effect, and as soon as that diamond ring disappears, bang, it's the eclipse. Take off the eclipse glasses and look at it. And I would recommend, don't take any pictures. And the reason is, this is gonna be one of the most photographed events ever by professional photographers, and there have been people that have gone to eclipses and they fiddle with their cameras so much, you only get two minutes and 30 seconds or 40 seconds of this, just look at it, okay? You'll get plenty of pictures of this thing later. Don't waste your time. Don't look at the eclipse through the screen on your iPhone. Look at it, okay? Okay, y'all have any questions about that? Oh, here's the path here. Well, you've got, we got the path spelled out over here, so we don't need to spend much time on that. What are the odds we're gonna get uh, to see it? I'll show you this. So it's about 50-50. This is weather data taken from airports, okay? And they've tried to calculate on, you know, late August, what does it look like? So there's different airports here. So these are percentages of the time that it's clear. It's Spirit of St. Louis Airport is about 15% of the time. View clouds, like 10%, 32%. Scattered is only 4%. Scattered is less than 50. Broken is more than 50. Overcast is overcast. So if you take uh, broken and overcast, you get 50%. Leave me over. I think these numbers are misleading because they don't have a time of day. And early in the morning, they're more likely to have the overcast and the, and the clouds, and then it all burns off, and maybe we get a clear day after that. So I'm hoping that uh, actually we'll have a better than 50-50 chance to actually see it. I mean, it's worth driving someplace to see the eclipse. So, you know, what we're going to do at our household, we're going to get up early in the morning. Believe me, the local TV stations are going to have eclipse forecasts, you know, that they're going to be talking about this eclipse. And so it's worth it to drive, if you have to drive to Columbia to get to the clear view of it, it's worth it. I know it's only two minutes and 40 seconds, but you, you will never forget. You can just see the solar corona. When did you see one? I saw one in the 1970s in Monk's Corner, South Carolina. And we did that. It was overcast everywhere except down there. And so we flew over to Mox Corners and landed at an airport. And we weren't the only ones. There were other people coming in, too. And, uh, and the guy running the airport had no idea it was even going to happen. That's what was mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> thing. So he came out, what's going on? Because we were, you know, the airport was suddenly getting crowded with people. And uh, so I told him, I said, there's going to be a total solar eclipse. And he didn't know what that was. And I said, well, it's going to get dark. It's going to be like nighttime here. And he, said, ah, he went back in the building. And then the eclipse totality hit, and he came running out cussing. <laughs> <laughs> what the? You know. <laughs> so he became a believer. And then the eclipse happened, and we all jumped in the airplanes and went home. What but, year was that? Uh, no, I can't remember. It was like 70. I'll have to look it up. It was in the 70s. Early 70s. Yeah, it might have been. It went across uh, the United States. How many of you have seen an eclipse? Carrot hands. Partial. Partial eclipse. Yeah, you, you need to see a total eclipse. I mean, it's really worth it. Get it. If it's going to be clear down in Carbondale, drive down to Carbondale. Okay? Load up and go down there. Get there. I mean, you know exactly what's going to happen. It's really about 1 20 or so. Get down there about 1 o'clock. And that's it. Yes, you the man the airport didn't turn off the runway lights. <laughs> yeah, I know. He, he was just dumbstruck, you know, so. <laughs> you say the speed of the moon shadow when it hits the west coast is 32 miles. No, it's actually going to be uh, uh, like 1,500 miles an hour. Wait, what, Something like that. Is that incorrect what it says there? Does it say 3,300? It, it must be kilometers or something. And then when it crosses the Atlantic, it's only 18 miles. Oh, okay. Why does okay. it go down? Okay. Oh, I can explain that. That's because the Earth is, it's, it's curved. So that, that's probably true. If, here's the Earth here, like this, all right? So let's look sideways at this thing. Let's say the moon is out here casting its shadow. And so it hits out here over the Pacific. Yeah. Okay. Well, as it moves across this curve, the curve is pretty sharp. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to look like it is really moving fast, coming because it's curved, it's running, it's, it's being projected on a curved surface. And when it gets around to where we are, 
We're right in the center of it. See, and so we're looking at the shadow passing across us like this. And so the, the, the motion of the, of the moon's shadow is going to be slowest where we are. And then when it gets to the other ocean down here, as it runs off the Earth, it's, the shadow is heading across that curved surface. Again, it's going to cover that curved surface very rapidly. It's going to look like it's moving pretty quick. Okay, remember the moon's shadow is being projected onto a sphere. Does that make sense? Okay, you see how that is? It'll look like it's going faster to an observer here and on the, at the end of it than it does right in the center. Okay. But the moon. Yeah, the moon's shadow moves northwest to southeast in this particular case. It always moves west to east across the, across the globe. I can't imagine it can move any faster. Whether it's 1,500 or 3,000, that, that's all fast. It is. If, if you look at, let's do a scale model here if we could. Here's the Earth. Let's say it's two inches. That's 8,000 miles. The moon is a quarter of a million miles away, 240,000 miles away. It's 30 times farther, 30 times this width. So it's out here someplace, and it's little. It's like half inch or something. Okay? And so as it moves, it's going around this circle here. Mm -hmm. And it's covering that circle how fast? 28 days. Right? So it goes from here. Imagine this curve it's making in seven days. So one day of travel is like this. The Earth here is only like this. See, so its shadow is going to cover, it's going to start at the west side of the Earth, because the Earth's rotating yeah. like this. We're looking down from the North Pole. It's going to swing right across the Earth very rapidly, just due to the geometry. The moon is moving in its orbit faster than the surface of the Earth is rotating. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's not like our rotation, here's the shadow sitting here, and we rotate underneath it. It doesn't happen that way. It's the moon moving along in its orbit, and it swings from west to east across the Earth. Okay. Is that against the, is this going in a different direction than the orbit around it? No. No, the moon goes this way, the Earth rotates this no, way also. Go the same way. Yeah. If you look down from the North Pole, this is the way the Earth seems to rotate. Yeah. See, because this, this would be the east side, well, it's coming up first, it's looking at the sun, yeah. and then it rotates around, finally the west coast gets there. Yeah. The moon moves in the same direction. Okay. Any other questions? Where would you recommend a good spot in the farming area? You know, the closer you can get to the to, towards uh, DeSoto, the longer the shadow will last, longer totality will last. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Okay, you gotta find a spot for a million people in DeSoto. Yeah, you gotta find a parking place. That could so, for instance, uh, the college is better than Farmington. Yeah. Okay, it'll be slightly longer here. If you can get farther to the north, if you have a friend with a, you know, a open space, that would be a good place to go. Yes, ma'am. What about Elephant Rocks? You could, you could go to Elephant Rocks. I, I don't know, we can take a look. I guess it's under the total. What you want to do, though, you want to be close to that center line so you get the longest view. I just, that would be up so high and you can get a good view. You could, yeah, if you get up on those rocks, it's, yeah. it's a good view around. That's true. If you go to airports, they usually have a pretty good skyline. Yeah. Other questions? I'm telling you, it's worth traveling to see this thing. Okay. And get some eclipse glasses. They sell them for two bucks here at the college. They sell them over here at the library, at the desk. In fact, they said they were going to go through the crowd <laughs> hawking these glasses for like a beer vendor. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Thank you all so much. Thank you.